Today we're going to be talking about benzodiazepines and some alternatives to benzodiazepines and also general anesthetics. These are all sedative hypnotic drugs, some of which are used to alleviate anxiety, others of which are used to uh, induce general anesthesia. I want to first talk about uh, a basic introduction to benzodiazepine. These are all what we call anxiolytic drugs. That is, they are used to treat anxiety or to alleviate anxiety. They are the most commonly prescribed psychotropic drugs. Uh, importantly, keep in mind, psychiatrists write less than 20% of U.S. prescriptions in this class of drugs. Most of these drugs are prescribed by physicians, family physicians, general practitioners, internal medicine doctors, etc. Important to understand that this class of drugs, these benzodiazepines, work very quickly to alleviate anxiety. In fact, they work instantly. They are for treatment of acute anxiety. We've already talked about selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and related drugs that can be used to treat chronic anxiety, but these take several weeks to um, take effect. So for immediate relief of anxiety, we often turn to the benzodiazepines. Now, they are not without their problems, but they can be used safely and effectively for treatment of occasional and uh, for immediate relief of anxiety. Uh, another alternative for treating anxiety is, of course, cognitive behavioral therapy. Very effective, but may take months, but tends to have a longer lasting effect after it's finished, whereas the benzodiazepines tend to be a temporary fix. <clears throat> so what are they used for, these benzodiazepines? Obviously, to alleviate anxiety. They can also be used as an anticonvulsant to treat epilepsy. They're often used in alcohol detoxification to keep people from getting uh, the shakes or to having seizures. They are used as sedative hypnotics to treat insomnia. They are used as central muscle relaxants to treat spasticity, particularly Valium. Uh, and they are also used as potentiation of the central nervous system depressants and anesthesia. So, wide variety of uses for this class of drugs. Of course, we're going to turn first to talking about the pharmacokinetics. The dosage and half-life varies significantly for the 12 drugs that are available in the United States. Their potency varies. Uh, and it really depends on the goal of treatment as to which of these might be the most effective. Most of these are lipid soluble and thus must be taken orally. The exception to the rule is midazolam or Versed. It is the only completely water soluble benzodiazepine. Most of the rest of them must be taken orally. There are injectable versions of Valium and Ativan that are intramuscular, but mostly these are taken. Uh, orally. Now, drugs like Ativ or Xanax and Ativan are sometimes abused, and people will crush them and snort them, which is uh, does absolutely nothing uh, but have a placebo effect. Because in order for a drug to be administered intranasally, it has to be water soluble, and these drugs are not at all water, water soluble. <clears throat> so we'll talk more about drugs of abuse as we move later on. But these drugs are. I uh, do have potential for abuse and certainly have potential for addictive properties. Um, again, only midazolam, diazepam, and lorazepam are injectable. Midazolam is only available as an injectable. Uh, it's primarily an intravenous drug, always used under physician's care, and it's almost always used uh, in an anesthesia setting. Um, some of these drugs do have active metabolites, which will increase their effective half-life, and we'll talk more about that. Diazepam or Valium has a long half-life. Its active metabolite, nor diazepam, has an even longer half-life, and in older adults, these are even longer. Uh, so it's important to understand that there are a variety of actions involved in these benzodiazepines. So this is a, a good overview of the short, intermediate, and long-acting Benzodiazepines, midazolam, which is also known as Versed, is again primarily used in anesthesia settings. Uh, triazolam or Halcyon is often used uh, to treat insomnia. They're not used to alleviate anxiety. But midazolam is used to alleviate anxiety in a surgical setting, but not, um, not in an outpatient setting. Uh, the intermediate acting benzodiazepines include alprazolam, which is Xanax. Um, lorazepam, which is Ativan, and of course there are some others, Tamazepam, etc. The longer-acting benzodiazepines are also 
uh, used significantly for alleviating anxiety, including uh, Librium, uh, Clonazepam, which is Clonopin, uh, Clorazepate, which is Transine, and Diazepam, which is Valium. There are, of course, Clorazepam and others. But these are the ones that are used most often. To give you an idea about their half-life, the short-acting uh, benzos like midazolam and triazolam have about a two and a half hour half-life. Uh, Alprazolam or Xanax has about a 12 hour half-life. Um, compare that to uh, clonopin or clonazepam, which has a 30 hour half-life. Um, <clears throat> again, it really depends on what the goal is uh, for treatment of these drugs. Now, for someone who wants a very short acting, help them get to sleep but not necessarily stay asleep. Triazolam or even alprazolam is probably a good choice. Somebody wants to try to stay asleep for more significant amounts of time, something like clonopin is probably a better choice, um, provided uh, they don't mind being having a hard time waking up. It really just depends on how people um, respond to these. Uh, Transine or clonazepam has to first be metabolized into nordiazepam, and nordiazepam has a 60-hour half-life. Uh, it's important to understand these have uh, very, very significant effects in the elderly that are very different from um, healthy adults, healthy younger adults. Um, the elderly have a reduced ability to metabolize, uh, particularly the longer-acting benzodiazepines. The elimination, the elimination half-life for diazepam and its metabolite nor diazepam is seven to ten days. So one dose of Valium is going to take a week to get to get rid of half of. Um, so that's really a significant problem for older adults. Um, for for, for shorter acting um, benzos, the dosage for an uh, older adult is about half what you would give a younger adult. There are, of course, significant side effects for these drugs. They can be dementing. Remember, these drugs have uh, significant effects on memory in older adults. They tend to mimic dementia. Uh, they can be depressive. And there is an increased rate of fall and hip fracture associated with use of these drugs in older adults. So there is um, significant risk in uh, prescribing these to an older adult. In fact, very few uh, responsible physicians will give these to an older adult who's not under someone else's care. Uh, again, all of these have very similar pharmacological effects. All benzodiazepines are pure GABA agonists. They fully facilitate GABA binding. At low doses, they will moderate anxiety, agitation, and fear actions by actions on receptors in the amygdala, the insula, and the orbital frontal cortex. Again, uh, these are reducing neural firing in those areas responsible for our primal emotions like fear and anxiety. And so they really are effective at those treatments. Uh, as we've talked already, these drugs do have significant amnesic properties and can result in cognitive confusion. This is primarily due to effects in the hippocampus and cortex. And finally, if, as I mentioned, some of these drugs can be used as muscle relaxers. Those qualities are due um, to both the anxiolytic properties and to GABA receptors in the spinal cord and brain stem, which will help release those spasticity uh, issues in uh, muscles. <clears throat> there are a variety of clinical uses for these drugs. Uh, the current clinical uses include, of course, treatment of debilitating anxiety, treatment of insomnia, treatment of muscle spasm and tension, uh, intentional anterior grade amnesia in clinical settings, particularly for conscious sedation, symptomatic treatment of panic attacks, nonspecific treatment of anxiety that may accompany other psychological disorders, and treatment of alcohol dependence. Now, the problem is you might create a new dependence. So uh, there is that problem. There are, of course, some important limitations for these drugs. They do have clear amnesic effects. There is the potential for rebound, which increases anxiety and insomnia, which can complicate withdrawal. They can be addicting, addicting drugs characterized by physical and psychological dependence. This is particularly problematic in patients with alcohol and substance abuse problems. As uh, single agents, they are not effective in treating comorbid depression. These are not antidepressants, although there is a belief that clonopin is antidepressive. It really has not been demonstrated to be so. It is an uh, anti-anxiety drug, but it is not an antidepressant drug. Um, they can make chronic pain worse. They carry the potential 
for lethality and overdosage, particularly when combined with alcohol or opioids, which we'll talk about later on. Importantly, benzodiazepines, even at low normal clinical doses, impair real-world driving performance. One milligram of alprazolam, which is Xanax, impaired driving, similar to the blood alcohol content of 0.15. Uh, I can tell you that's a pretty large dose of Xanax. Uh, this is a drug I take on occasion for anxiety and to help sleep. I take a quarter milligram. Um, a milligram, I would be asleep all day. So not only would it impair my driving, it would impair my ability to be awake. Um, so that's a pretty heavy dose, but they do impair driving. Uh, it appears that women are more affected by the side effects, uh, cognitive side effects for Xanax than are men. And there were significant detrimental effects in driving, memory, and in trying to divide attention amongst tasks. It's important to understand there are some significant cognitive effects of these drugs. There are, of course, well-indicated and valid current uses. Oftentimes, these are used as pre-anesthetic medications for sedation and to induce amnesia. Again, sometimes these are used for intentional drug-induced anterior grade amnesia. And perhaps for acute treatment of debilita debilitating anxiety. Um, it, you will, of course, accept the accompanying cognitive and psychomotor impairments to deal with that acute treatment of anxiety, but not for chronic treatment of anxiety. Um, there are, of course, significant side effects associated with these drugs, including sedation, drowsiness, ataxia, lethargy, mental confusion, motor and cognitive impairments, disorientation, slurred speech, amnesia or dementia, and, of course, these were uh, traditionally hypnotic, that is, the idea is that you could be hypnotized more likely under the influence of these drugs. There are, of course, physical and psychological dependence issues, especially in those with substance abuse disorders. Importantly, these drugs are associated with possible fetal, fetal abnormalities. And what's critical for you to understand here is that some can affect chromosomes in both sperm and ovum. So birth defects can be caused by use from mother or father. So if you, and this is particularly true for midazolam. Or Versed. So if you're undergoing an outpatient procedure using midazolam or Versed, you want to avoid any reproductive activity for the weeks following uh, that drug because these are uh, fairly long-lasting side effects. So you want to carefully talk about that with your doctor. And of course, there are significant interactions with uh, alcohol and other sedatives uh, that can be both dangerous and clearly affecting uh, cognitive functioning. Uh, this is, of course, a class of drugs which has some potential for abuses. Obviously, this is not something we want to use as a long-term treatment of life anxieties. Um, treatment of drug-induced memory bound and insomnia can be problematic um, because you end up sort of creating a longer-term cycle. There are, of course, uh, date rape drugs, one of the banned drugs in the United States, lunitrazepam or rohypnol, uh, is basically done as a date rape drug. Uh, Long-term treatment of alcohol withdrawal just creates a new addiction. Uh, obviously, people will self-medicate for psychological distress with these, and we obviously want to avoid using the long-acting benzodiazepines in the elderly. There are, of course, advantages and disadvantages using benzodiazepines and thinking about these for an individual are important. Uh, these are very safe drugs. They have low toxicity. Unlike barbiturates or alcohol, they can be used safely. They don't induce metabolic enzymes, so don't accelerate their own metabolism, so tolerance isn't uh, generated. They act on uh, central nervous system. Uh, peripheral organs and liver are not impaired, so this is a central nervous system drug. Disadvantages to using these drugs are, of course, they can be amnesic. Uh, tolerance can develop in the brain. Uh, that is, the brain just doesn't respond as much, much like alcohol tolerance. There is a pen the potential for dependency and for withdrawal, particularly in people who are using them long term. And of course, they are potentially uh, abused as well. Obviously, they will also potentiate other sedative hypnotics, and so should never be used in combination with other sedative hypnotics. So, well, we mentioned this a number of times. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the uh, effects of benzodiazepines on memory. Um, 
And I see I've made a typo here, but we'll live with it. Uh, all benzodiazepines have the potential to cause temporary anterior grade amnesia. Um, and that's something uh, to keep in mind, that all of these drugs can have this effect. Uh, this is primarily for what we call episodic memory. That is memory for what your life episodes are. So what did you do yesterday? What did you do the day before? What did you study last night? All of these drugs have that effect. So if this is a drug that you have available, you want to make sure you're not combining that with your studying because uh, that uh, they do have significant reductions in ep episodic memory performance that are not state dependent. Okay. Um, now, obviously, this amnesia can be useful for pre-surgical preparations. Again, there are some things in surgery that are oftentimes unpleasant, and um, this can really help a patient if they don't have to remember the trauma of that surgery. Um, they may not be a problem. This law, temporary amnesia may not be a problem if they're taken for sleep because people are asleep anyway. We're going to talk about issues with the um, BZRAs here in a minute in which people don't remember doing things like eating or going to the store or that sort of thing, which they're awake but don't have any memory for. Um, importantly, high anxiety itself may worsen memory. So in very anxious um, people, benzodiazepines may not be amnesic. So that could be a problem, obviously, in a surgical setting. So we really have to be very careful about these effects. Um, interestingly, there is uh, a study I read recently about people with red hair, that is real red hair, uh, there's something about their genotype which makes them uh, much faster at metabolizing these drugs. So uh, drugs like midazolam, which are used in anesthesia, people with red hair have to be given twice as much anesthesia to get the same effect. So there are some important individual differences in how these drugs um, affect people. So what's happening here? Well, of course, we know GABA is known to inhibit long-term potentiation in the hippocampus which is that neural process believed to be responsible for memory consolidation. Primarily, these drugs have an effect on what we call explicit memory. That is memory for conscious experiences or conscious memory for experiences. We also have what's called implicit memory, which is an unconscious form of memory. And midazolam doesn't affect that, but it does affect our conscious memory. And again, critically, people are unaware of their effects on memory. And that's some research that we've done uh, in my uh, past. Finally, combined with alcohol, these have a severe effect on memory. Um, my friend Miriam Mitzer at John Hopkins has done some really interesting work with lorazepam and zolpidem that show when combined with alcohol, they have a really wall up on memory. So try not to make that combination. The last thing I want to mention is there is an interesting drug called flumazenil. And flumazenil will completely block the benzodiazepine receptor. And in fact, will completely reverse any effects of a benzodiazepine that was given prior to flumazenil. This is one of the things that makes use of benzodiazepines in a clinic so safe. And the reason why midazolam is such a safe drug to give, because you completely reverse the action of uh, midazolam by introducing flumazenil. So it's a completely reversible uh, drug. So it's pretty remarkable in that way. So that's uh, a quick review of benzodiazepines. I'm going to turn next to talk about what are called non-benzodiazepine benzodiazepine receptor agonists, or BZRAs. Um, generally, these drugs are not anxiolytic. Most will actually bind to that GABA receptor. Again, much like um, benzodiazepines, they're actually are benzodiazepine receptor agonists. So they boost the functioning of benzodiazepines, which then boost GABA. And there are currently three of these on the market. Zolpidem, which is Ambien, uh, Zeloplon, which is Sonata, and uh, Lunesta. Quick um, introduction to these drugs. Uh, Ambien has a half-life of about two to two and a half hours. Very difficult to overdose on Ambien and just be very sleepy for a long time. Um, you really want to try to limit your use of this drug because it, it does have some very weird side effects. Um, oftentimes, people will hallucinate when they're under the influence of Ambien. Um, it's the reason I don't take it. Um, and there are, of course, significant potential for um, people to do things while they're under the influence of these drugs that they don't remember. So that's Ambien, 
Uh, Sonata has a very short half-life, less than an hour. It can be used on short notice, non-addictive, so if somebody needs to quickly get to sleep, but needs to be able to be awake in a couple of hours, this is a drug that will work for that. Lunesta is similar to Zolpidem and traditional benzodiazepines has a much longer half-life. Um, there is an increased risk, risk of next day sedation, that is people having sort of a Lunesta hangover. Um, and so this is a long-term use for treating insomnia. Um, but certainly not something you want to take if you need to be functional in just a few hours, because so this is a much longer, longer lasting um, half-life. Um, as I mentioned, there is the potential uh, for doing things while you're sleeping, including sleep driving. So in 2007, the FDA required that all sedative and hypnotics used to induce or maintain sleep must warn of the risk of sleep driving. People will drive while not fully awake and have no memory of the event. Um, they will also make phone calls, prepare to eat food, um, etc. People will wake up the next day and half the food's out of the refrigerator and they'll have no, they'll think somebody broke into their house. Um, importantly, blood levels of drugs sufficient to block memory um, can happen in the absence of a sleep state. So that is, you can get to the point where memory is blocked, but not be to the point where you're sleeping. So it's important to understand people are actually awake, they call it sleep driving, but they're not asleep, they just don't remember it. Okay, um, I think it's important to have a full understanding of these drugs because they're used so much, they're prescribed so often, they're more than likely somebody you know takes one of these. So it's really important to understand the risks uh, and benefits of these drugs. Okay, let's now turn and talk about general anesthetics. Um, obviously these aren't drugs that are ever used or abused, but they are certainly used uh, in a clinical setting. Um, they are central nervous system depressants. They will produce unconsciousness for surgery. They can be in, administered through inhalation through, or through uh, injection. Some of the inhaled anesthetics are subject to abuse. So nitrous oxide, for example, which is oftentimes used at the dentist, um, is uh, a drug of abuse. In fact, um, it's problematic because nitric, nitrous oxide is also used to charge things like whipped cream containers, and so people will abuse them through whippets. Um, it can be very dangerous to do so. Um, all of these involve some sort of GABA agonism. There are ultra short, act, short acting barbiturates like biopentanol or brevitol. Propofol, which is diprovan, is another uh, very short acting um, GABA agonist. All of these involve facilitation of GABA receptors. They have no analgesic or usually no euphoric activity, and they're onset is usually immediate. And so these are used as anesthetics because they can be administered, patients asleep within moments, um, and they wear off relatively quickly, uh, particularly the injected versions. The uh, inhaled anesthetic, like halothane, much more difficult to, to regulate. So uh, these are, are where most of the um, anesthesia drugs are turning. Uh, ketamine is another general anesthetic drug. It's used primarily in veterinary um, administration. This induces, induces both unconsciousness and amnesia. The problem is this can be particularly uh, dangerous. It's also very unique. It induces both analgesia and psychedelic hallucinations. This is why it's often a drug of abuse. In fact, usually what's, uh, how it's abused is the liquid version of ketamine that would be used to inject the same animal is um, set up to dry, uh, and essentially the dissolved ketamine inside the liquid suspension uh, becomes a powder and it's then snorted. Uh, unlike other anesthetics, it does not reduce blood pressure, so this can be important for critically ill surgery patients. If somebody is uh, very sick and already has low blood pressure, ketamine is probably uh, worth exploring its use, but it does have very psychedelic uh, properties. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about the psychedelics. Um, finally, we've already talked a little bit about the serotonin receptor agonists as anxiolytics. Don't want to visit that in any more detail because we spent a lot of time on that with antidepressants, but we do understand that anxiety may result in part from defects in serotonin transmission. 
and all six clinically available SSRI antidepressants are widely prescribed for anxiety disorders and are actually considered to be the first choice of drugs for long-term anxiety. Thank you very much. We will turn next to talk about natural remedies.